progress comes to a world of magic as science and the arcane combine to make marvels. Meet steampunk inventors and orc mystics at the Volsung Hub on beastsofwar.com. Become a general of mighty armies at the Kings of War Hub. Take command of elves, dwarves and orcs in this game of masked fantasy combat on beastsofwar.com. Hi guys and welcome again to What's in the Box. I am of course joined by Gianna hey, everybody. and I'm going to bore the life out of her with another Warlord kit uh, of the Stug 3, the Sturmgeschutz. So I'm going to show that lovely box under the camera <laughs> if I can find it. There it is. The Stug Alf's D. And this is nice because this is a early war version of the Stug. Um, and this is basically what you would know as today as intimate fire support you know, for the infantry. Mm -hmm. So this is your, your close infantry support at the time. So instead of having, if you didn't necessarily have air support in the area, you'd be calling a battery of these up to support you at close range. So those were position softening guns. Yes. So they'd roll up to something, fire their high explosive, and then move on in with the infantry and support them in the attack roll. Um, but of course, a lot of people know the Stug as an anti-tank weapon. Um, because they were later up armored or up gunned with a long barrel 75 millimeter gun, which then made them a very effective tank killer in the defensive role. How effective were they, John? They were very effective. They were the most employed vehicle by the German army, the Stugs, the long barrel and the short barrel version. Now, the, the short barrel version sort of phased out in around 1943 or so when they started to go into the likes of the desert, where ranges weren't 200 yards or 300 yards anymore, they were six, seven, eight hundred. Something like that, you know, proper, where you really need really artillery. Really long distance, yeah. yeah. So, at the time, these guys would have... These guys actually came in right at the start of the war and followed up the infantry with um, the likes of the infantry support tank at the time, which was the Panzer IV, before it got the bigger gun and then became sort of almost a main battle tank. But they still had their uses. I mean, you know, you can get right up behind your... Almost, you know, if you're getting ready to do a big push, you'd soften up that... You know, because you had mortars, you had light artillery, and then medium, and then heavy artillery. And, yep. You know, especially in the beginning, like you were saying, if you were, like in the invasion of Poland, and the beginning of the war, you, you were moving fast, so the Blitzkrieg, yep. you would need something that was very highly mobile to mm -hmm. soften up positions. So, I mean, it didn't have its uses. I mean, they, were they still using them at the end of the war? Um, towards the end, the Stug was still in service, mm -hmm. but they'd stopped building the chassis for the Panzer III, so whatever Stug threes were still out there... The Did they last. end up converting those with the bigger guns? They upgunned them? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so in around 1942-43, they started to upgun them, especially when they came across the Russians and mm -hmm. started fighting T-34s. They realized that these weren't going to be as a... These were too much investment sure. in something that couldn't take out a tank. So they realized they needed to upgun them. All right, let's see what's in the box. Yeah, absolutely. This is what an unboxing is for. Uh-oh, that's not a good sign when the first thing you pull out is flames and smoke. Oh, listen to that, yeah. <laughs> I won't tell you what I call tanks. It would hurt John's feelings. So. No, you you say it, and I'll I'll prove you wrong or tell it's you. Just you're a rolling wrong. coffin. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, she's right. <laughs> <laughs> well, up well, modern tanks. Yeah, they're still the same. I mean, everything has its uses. So yeah, employed correctly, they're highly effective. With a skilled crew and a skilled commander telling them what to do, very effective. Yes, most definitely. Unfortunately, when the T thirty four first came out, it had none of that. So <laughs> I kind of like that the uh, Warlord put the smoke markers yeah, in there. This, the smoke markers are very cool, actually. I'm just going to see if I can get them under camera here. They have a little transfer sheet in here, uh, which has the, um, yeah, actually it has the proper symbols and everything. So we have the Africa Corps symbols in there. Oh, no kidding. Look at that. Uh, the painted out uh, crosses, which I think you'll either leave blank or you'll put the white into the middle of the smaller ones and then some of your numbering, your vehicle numbering as well, which is all very good. The markers. We have Smoke and Flame, which is black and red and orange, respectively. And then we have a little bit of smoke, which is just a little bit of grey. That's a really nice touch. It is a nice touch. They've, yeah. they've been improving the kits a lot lately, and one of the improvements has been adding this sort of stuff into it, which is great. It even has a stat card. What? A stat card? Yep. So, if I throw that under camera as well. So, German Assault Gun, and it gives you... The points cost for inexperienced, regular, and veteran as well. Look at that. That is awesome. What's the other side showing? So the other side is just a little bit of background background and talking about what sort of... Well, it's actually giving you the, oh, yeah. the weapon you got your ranges. down there. You know what? That's really nice. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a lot of games have been going that way with the cards for easy reference instead of pulling out the big old, you know, 
rule book. Yeah. Because you can have your cards laid out for your forces, and that's yeah. actually really nice. And it, it gives you the choice of, do I sit down to build an army and just pull the models off the shelf, or do I have a whole pile of these and I start to, you know, sort of theory craft out the, the yeah. army list by laying them all yeah. down and figuring Quick out Quick and easy reference. Side. Nothing yeah. better than that. So on to the vehicle. And I think we'll start off with the hull, which has got a lot of detail going on in there. So we have the gun mount there, we have a position for the periscope for the gun sight, a lot of riveting, <laughs> see what I did there? Riveting bolting details. Uh, yeah, see that? Awesome. I think you should count every rivet and make sure it's correct. I'm not going to because I don't, <laughs> I haven't been that close to the real vehicle, so I wouldn't know. Uh, we have the engine decking details as well. And what should be, yeah, the exhausts are already there, so there's bits you don't have to glue it on to. That's a big hunk of resin. It is. And then we add to that with the track sections as well. Oh, those tracks are nice. I like yeah. the detail on there. So that actually fits pretty clean straight out of the box too. I'm quite, quite happy with that. So when we come to glue that together, that should be pretty easy to put together. And of course, second track section. So I'll move these out of the way. Very nice, by the way. Yeah, they are. Very nice. And we have a bunch of metal parts here as well. So here we have the short barreled 75 millimeter gun, uh, which the, the Germans affectionately called the stubby gun. Because it doesn't look like much. <laughs> I could touch that one, but I'm not going to. <laughs> it doesn't look like much, but still effective. It's not the size that counts. No, it's the size, it's the HE <laughs> shell that you fire. Uh, a few other hatch details. These are for the crew hatches on the top of the hull. And then. Lordy Lou, we have bits of exhaust, towing eyes, headlights, that sort of stuff. Gun cleaning kit, because if you don't have a gun cleaning kit, your gun ain't gonna work. Uh, mud guards, and yeah, that's basically it. So, a pretty simple kit, not a lot of parts to it, which is nice. Warlord have been increasing that sort of ease of build buildability mm -hmm. uh, recently, so the, the tanks are coming in fewer parts, but the casting quality is getting a lot better. Like we did the, the Hellcat a while ago, and I think the Hellcat was, the hull was entirely one piece. Which always is nice. Yeah, it, tracks yeah. and everything all in one piece, it was fantastic. Because I don't know about some people, but there are times where I go to glue together some resin, and it just, for whatever reason, does not want to stick. You clean it, you clean it, and... Scrub it with a scarring pad? Is that it? You could try, you know, a yeah. bit of steel wool? Yeah. And just scar the, the faces together? Learn something new every day. That might, that might do it. Or sandpaper, if you have sandpaper. sandpaper. Yeah. So... We're going to go off and get this thing built and primed, and when we come back, we'll have a look at the vehicle, and I'll um, do my wax lyrical thing while Jana passes out from board. <sighs> well, somebody's got to do it, right? And welcome back. So I have the stug put together and a little bit of primer stuck down on it, just to let you see what it all looks like together, and here you go. Boom! Wow, that does look really good. That's nice, isn't it? Yeah. It's such a, a compact little vehicle, especially with like, the long barrel gun on it. It just... It cleans up nice once you get it all together. Yeah, yeah, it's it went together really well. I'll get a wider shot here so you can see the vehicle. So, just a, a nice looking all around little vehicle and a nice detail on it, easy to put together. And once you get some paint down on it, that's going to look pretty sweet. Mm -hmm. um, because it's early war, you're going to be sticking to uh, a grey and brown scheme. So the typical pans are grey with a little bit of brown spattered in there for some camouflage unless you're doing early Russian campaign first winter or something like that, get some whitewash down, that would be pretty cool to do. Um, I might actually do a tutorial on that at some point. Doing that the, would be good. I mean, but there's a lot of people out there that would like to see that. Yeah, do the hairspray. Because it's not as easy as, you know, oh, I can just throw a little bit of this down, a little bit, and I'll look. It, it, there actually is a method to that madness. Yeah, absolutely. But... Uh, is this story time, Uncle John? It might be. <laughs> get your pillow or some popcorn. You guys can have popcorn, Janet needs a pillow. So the, the only real good thing or interesting thing I know about the Stug, or the early version of the Stug anyway, is that, um, do you know the tankiest Michael Vittman? I've heard of him. You've heard of him? He started on armored cars and then moved on to Stugs. Did he really? And, uh, Wasn't he um, Tiger? Tiger. He finished on Tiger. Um, but the, the first time he was, or the first few engagements he had in Russia when he moved off armored car onto Stugs, in one of these with the short barrel gun, he took on a... Uh, a platoon of T-34s and actually managed to knock out like three or four of them before having to retreat. Really? Yeah. He was part of a reconnaissance squadron and he was out on his own and uh, seen a bunch of them come over the rise and started engaging them. With a weapon that wasn't designed to be a direct action weapon. Yeah. How fast? I mean, were these pretty mobile? They're, uh... 
they they I think they're they're capable of doing about twenty three twenty five miles an hour. So they're nippy, but T thirty four would have been faster. Faster, yeah. Okay. Um, and would have been more mobile over rough ground because the suspension on these things is rubbish. Is it? Yeah, it's not. It's not the best. But it's do they still... have one of those at your tank museum at Bovington? Yeah. Yes, they do. Ooh. They do. They will actually be running it as well uh, when I go to see it at Tank Fest. So nice. I'll be driving that about. That'll be really nice to see. Beautiful engine on them as well. Nice little, nice little noisy little engine. So yeah, I can't remember what the engine is, but there you go. <laughs> so if you were playing bolt action, how would you play that? I would leave that in cover at close range. I wouldn't let it get over sort of half range where it starts to get penalties to hitting stuff. Mm -hmm. I would definitely be only firing HE from it. Probably, depending on who you're facing. If you're facing a, a Russian infantry horde, why have, a, why have AP at all? Right, yeah, that, <laughs> ma that makes no sense. Exactly. Um, I'd probably run them maybe if, if I was playing standard rules, I'd maybe have two of them. I'd run a, a, an army with two platoons and then take two of these with them. If I'm playing tank war, I take um, probably a squadron or a zug, which is about three or four of them, mm -hmm. supported by Panzer threes or fours, something like that. So I'd do a proper armored force with it, a bit of infantry, so anti-infantry, and a bit of anti-tank in with it too. Sweet. Yeah. So all in all, a lovely kit, a lovely vehicle. Can't wait to see one in real life up close, running around. Be great. I will bore everybody on Beast of War with another video uh, from that event. <laughs> Like I did with it's Tiger, all good. Like I did with Tiger Day. So guys, thank you very much for watching. Let me know what you think of the Stug. If you've been running it in games, uh, tell people what you think of them in action. Maybe you're not happy with them or maybe you're overjoyed with them. Who knows? Get your comments in and we'll see you again soon. Go ahead and check out our other content on screen now. And be sure to check out beastofwar.com for the latest gaming news and gaming let's plays. And while you're at it, why not hit subscribe and remember to ding our dong. Go on, you know you want to click it. Go on.